topic for this morning is megacities and federalism, which is rather for many, for many conventional uh, uh, many many conventional participants seems like an unusual topic, but really has become one of great importance over the last quarter century or so, as you've seen the rise of metropolitan regions and megacities all over the world, uh, who really don't fit very well into the traditional scheme of federalism. Uh, so this morning we we have with us a very very distinguished panel from various parts of the world. Uh, to, to uh, ponder this issue and discuss uh, the issues of fragmentation, uh, the place of metropolitan governance, and the role of megacities uh, in, in federalism. Uh, let, me, let me start by introducing the moderator, uh, Enid Slack, uh, a dear friend and a collaborator. Uh, Enid is the director of the Institute of Municipal Finance and Governance uh, at the Monk School from the University of Toronto, and somebody uh, I've known for many years and worked very closely with, and in my view, uh, probably the world's uh, greatest living expert on municipal finance. Uh, and uh, you know, with this, I will hand the the panel over to Enid to allow her to introduce the 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 the, the, the other panelists and to drive forward what promises to be a very very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rupak. What a lovely introduction. I hope I can live up to the expectations you've created. <laughs> um, I'd also like to welcome everyone uh, to this panel on megacities and federal governance. We all know that megacities are very large cities. Uh, the official definition of megacities is cities with over 10 million people. In 1950, there were only two megacities in the world, Tokyo and New York. In 1990, there were 10. In 2018, there were 33 megacities. You know, cities like Buenos Aires, Los Angeles, Mexico City, Mumbai. And 15 of these 33 cities are located in nine federal countries. As Rupak suggested, megacities are similar to metropolitan areas. They are characterized by a dense urban core and surrounding towns and villages that are dependent on the core. Why do we care about megacities? Well, obviously there are a lot of people living there. That's why we care. 12% of the world's population lives in megacities. But megacities are also important because they are generators of wealth, employment, innovation, and productivity growth. And they are often the economic engine in their country. For example, Buenos Aires accounts for about 38% of the GDP of Argentina, Mexico City for almost 19% of the GDP of Mexico. People are attracted to megacities because of their economic and social opportunities. They come for jobs, they come for services, they come to shop, they come for cultural activities, and these centers are often regional hubs. But when a lot of people come together uh, in densely populated areas, there are growing problems. And we have seen these in megacities around the world. Transportation gridlock, inadequate affordable housing, increasing income inequality, air and water pollution. And we've seen the impact of climate change and yes, the impact of pandemics. All of these problems that I've raised need to be addressed on a metropolitan-wide or a region-wide basis. But it's not always easy to do that because the governance of megacities is highly fragmented. Metropolitan areas in many cases have multiple jurisdictions within their boundaries. Let me give you some examples. Los Angeles is governed by 200 city governments and five county governments. The Sao Paulo metropolitan region comprises 39 municipalities, including the city of Sao Paulo. In Buenos Aires, responsibility for services is shared among the city of Buenos Aires, the Buenos Aires provincial government, 19 municipal governments in the province, and the federal government. And looking at Mumbai, the metropolitan region comprises the municipal corporation of Greater Mumbai, seven municipal corporations, 13 municipal councils, parts of two districts, over 900 villages, plus state agencies and central government activities. So why does this fragmentation matter? Well, it makes it very difficult to coordinate services such as transportation, land use planning, economic development across multiple jurisdictions. It's also difficult to generate revenue 
because people move around in response to taxes. So if one municipality in the metropolitan area raises its taxes, people, businesses may simply move to a neighboring jurisdiction. And it's difficult to share the costs of municipal services fairly across the region. Again, some municipalities in the region may have a, a rich tax base and few expenditures to make. Others may have to make a lot of expenditures and have a very small tax base. How can we share those costs across the region? Well, part of the answer to addressing these metro-wide issues that megacities face is to have intergovernmental cooperation and coordination, both horizontally and vertically. Horizontal coordination is needed among municipalities within a region, so they can work together to deliver services that cross municipal boundaries, things like transit. Vertical coordination with national and state governments is needed so that local governments have the powers and the resources they need to function. The size and economic importance of megacities mean they cannot be ignored by other levels of government. But at the same time, the size and economic importance create tensions with other levels of governments who feel threatened by cities that are that large and powerful. So with those opening remarks, let's turn to our panel for today. We have a fabulous panel from around the globe to talk to you about these and other issues around megacities and federal governance. First, we have Jonathan Malaya. Jonathan is the Undersecretary for Plans, Public Affairs and Communications, an official spokesperson of the Department of the Interior and Local Government of the Government of the Philippines. Jonathan is also Chair of the Task Force on Governance, Subtask Group on Risk Communications, and member of the Vaccine Cluster National Task Force COVID-19. Welcome, Jonathan. Alejandra Reyes. Okay. Alejandra Reyes is Assistant Professor of Urban Planning and Public Policy at UC Irvine's School of Social Ecology. Her research looks at the relationships between governance, housing production, and issues of access, and highlights the critical influence of political and economic factors on urban development. And I have to say personally how delighted I am to see Alejandra here today because she was a postdoctoral fellow at our Institute of Municipal Finance and Governance a few years ago and did a lot of great work for us on Mexico City. Uh, lastly, Nico Stegler, who is the South African Research Chair in Multilevel Government, Law and Development at the Della Omar Institute of Constitutional Law, Governance and Human Rights at the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa. And again, on a personal note, I'm delighted to welcome Nico. We've done a lot of work together over the years on issues of local government and in particular metropolitan governance. So the way we're gonna run the panel today is I'm gonna pose a couple of questions to each of the panelists and we'll go one by one with answers. And then towards the end of the event, we will take questions from the audience. So I'm going to ask you if you would please write your questions. If you're on YouTube, uh, use the YouTube chat box to put your questions in. If you're on Facebook, uh, use the comment section on Facebook. And I will try as much as I can uh, to get through as many questions uh, as the time permits at the end. So with that, let's go to the first question. And Jonathan, I'm going to start with you. And the question is, we've talked about the things that megacities need to do. And, and what I'm going to ask you is what powers and financial resources do megacities need to succeed? And also, and we talked about the tensions between these large cities and other governments. How can they convince state and federal governments to give them those powers and resources that they need? So Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much, Enid. And uh, before I begin, I'd like to uh, greet the Forum of Federations, a happy 20th anniversary. And thank you for having me in this pan. Um, it's a very um, uh, complicated uh, question that, uh, it's uh, difficult to answer in five minutes, but I'll try as much as I can, because as many of you know, um, Metro Manila um, is one of the mega cities in the world, uh, where I am now. Uh, we have, uh, based on our 2015 census, 12,877,253 people. 
And that was in 2015. You can just imagine how many people there are now today, which uh, con constitutes 12.8% of the population of the country and contributes a significant amount of gross domestic product uh, to the Philippine economy. The Philippines is not officially a federal country, but because of our local government code, it has some federal features. So I'm delighted to be here and to share our experience in so far as this is concerned. To answer the question, I think um, in terms of uh, financial resources, the mega cities have to have significant taxing powers because of the large amount of uh, responsibilities and functions that they have to address. For example, here in the Philippines, uh, there's 11.6 million motor vehicles registered in 2018 in the metropolitan area alone, which is an increase of almost 1.2 million of, or 11.4% from the 2017 uh, figure. And then again, you have the question of uneven development of cities. There's disparity of wealth in income. As you mentioned, the, uh, just like any other mega city in the world, the Philippines has several city or municipal jurisdiction across metropolitan Manila. We have 17, 16 highly urbanized cities and one municipal corporation. So these uh, entities, local government units, which we call them here, would, would need um, a lot of taxing powers to be able to undertake the responsibilities that the government and uh, the local government code has bestowed upon them. So in terms of financial resources, they must have their own source income, in addition, of course, to real property taxes and business taxes. There also must be, in my opinion, significant fiscal transfers coming from the uh, national government to the uh, municipal corporations and city uh, cities that comprise the metropolitan area or the mega city. And uh, we call that here as the internal revenue allotment. So we are slowly increasing our internal revenue allotment and in 2022, the projected internal revenue allotment share for the entire country would jump by 313 billion pesos from the current allocation. And a large part of that will go to the corporations within Metro Manila because of the uh, high density population in those areas. In terms of powers, uh, municipal, uh, the mega cities need uh, significant powers to be able to address the needs of the constituency within the mega city. And uh, I'll, try, I, I'll try to answer uh, that question in our next round, no? because uh, there I'll be able to explain more of how the uh, levels of government interact in a mega city such as Metro Manila. Thank you. Just uh, to follow up on that, you said more taxing power. So uh, Manila has property and business taxes. What would you be suggesting here? An income tax, a sales tax, a fuel tax, a vehicle tax? What, 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 what do you think would be the best for, for Manila and other metro municipalities? Well, most of those taxes in the Philippines are uh, collected by the national government, but there, there is a significant fiscal transfer to the local governments. So uh, the Supreme Court recently decided that the source of the fiscal transfers should not only include internal revenue taxes, but should now include customs duties, for example, or taxes from the national wealth. So um, I don't think um, local government units in a metropolitan Manila area would require more taxes. I think what they would require uh, is uh, more fiscal transfers from the national government and for the, uh, the government to implement uh, that decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, slowly, uh, there has been already acceptance by the national government that the Supreme Court decision has to be followed. So local government units in, in Mega Manila 
are expected to have an increase of 30% from their existing fiscal transfers from the national government. So uh, right now, they're not thinking of uh, more taxes. They're thinking of more fiscal transfers from the national government. Great, thank you. Alejandra. Thank you, um, Ined, and um, I also appreciate the invitation. So on this question, I think I'll focus a, a little bit more on the powers and political side of the question. Um, I'm a bit more knowledgeable on that side than on the financial side, but um, perhaps to follow up a little bit on, the, on, on what the previous panelists uh, shared, um, the, the, two, the two experiences that I think I will discuss um, a bit further perhaps in, 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 the, in the following uh, round of questions. Uh, one, um, it's in uh, Guadalajara, our second largest uh, metropolitan region in, in Mexico, uh, but also currently I've, I've been for two years um, sort of in the fringes of, of um, LA, uh, the, the, the biggest metro here in the US. And in both cases, um, unfortunately, or for better or worse, um, municipal revenues um, are, are very are very weak um, de facto we, we have a property tax uh, tax cap here in California um, and in, in Mexico well uh, actually uh, the de facto capacity and resources of municipalities are very weak so so yeah the one thing that I thought to emphasize was that the, the political will, will and budget decisions, um, in both cases, I think at the federal and state level are, are truly very important, um, as, as I, um, I'm sure we all know. Um, the one thing that I think has been um, uh, sort of emerging um, and evolving over the last uh, few years in the Guadalajara case, it's that of international cooperation and a, a little bit of funds have uh, been able, like, well, and, and uh, Metropolitan Institute that I'll talk about has been able to draw some resources from international uh, organizations more than anything for research purposes, but, but still, uh, that's something. Um, on the governance side of things, um, so ideally, um, all right, governance really uh, uh, very generally, uh, it's, it's a process that involves not only government actors, but also uh, non-government actors in, in the private sector organizations, uh, residents. Um, however, I've, one of the things that I've, I've uh, always been very interested in, it's how there's, there's generally some power imbalances um, that, are, that are very important to address um, in terms of metropolitan governance when there's negotiations and deliberations um, around uh, shared issues uh, so that, that the formulation of common objectives and agreements can, um, can really sort of be, uh, lead to accountable and democratic uh, outcomes. Um, and so that the coordination of resources and efforts can be, can be more efficient. And uh, one topic, um, recently and, and around the topic of metropolitan governance, I think has been that of decentralization uh, because that's that's a process that um, that was very heavily pushed under the idea that um, of course local governments would be the closest to the people the people and and would lead um, to more democratic outcomes. But here again, I think the U.S. and Mexico cases uh, offer sort of contrasting and interesting uh, examples because decentralization, um, a, a, a slight critique of it, I think through the years has been that in, in, in the case of places like the US, it has led to really extreme competition on the ground between local jurisdictions. And on the other side of the spectrum in a, in a context like the, the, the Mexican case, um, as I mentioned before, uh, municipal governments de facto have really, really limited um, de facto capacity and resources. Um, and so they're very, uh, they're relatively weak financially and uh, politically. Um, another of the sort of also um, ideas and, and perhaps even sort of uh, questions that emerged when I was thinking about these questions, it's how um, the, the feasibility of metropolitan governance um, it's, it's very contingent, of course, on, on levels of fragmentation, disparities that there, 
that exists between jurisdictions, uh, power dynamics, um, and, and paradoxically, arguably, actually, the places that are most fragmented and that have all of these challenges, it's perhaps where metropolitan governance, um, it's most in need, uh, but hardest to implement. Um, and I think I'll close um, by, by saying that um, the setting of objectives um, that a particular mega region might have, uh, are also generally very diverse. Uh, like some metropolitan regions might focus on, on regulation, on service provision, redistribution, uh, minimizing certain externalities, uh, or even managing environmental concerns more and more. Um, but with this in mind, I think it's also worth asking how much uh, local governments are themselves willing sometimes, like we've encountered this, especially in the US case, uh, willing to actually cooperate and coalesce, uh, especially when there's uh, really important uh, differences uh, between their financial conditions. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, you raised a number of interesting issues there, one of which was the importance of not just including governments, but non-governmental actors in making things happen. I, I do have to ask you about Mexico though, because you've done so much work on Mexico City and it has recently changed from having one metropolitan governance structure, a federal district into being a city state, having the powers of a city and state government. Has that made a difference to its powers uh, and resources? Yeah, of course. Uh, so, so, and I remember us having these conversations uh, a couple of years ago um, and me being a bit unfortunately uh, pessimistic as to how, how much this shift would, would really lead to, to uh, a stronger metropolitan governance. Because I, like, I think it was an important shift because it gave a lot more uh, sort of capacities and jurisdictions to, to Mexico City. But the political boundaries of, of the city didn't change, uh, right? The, and just their attributions. And so Mexico City, in my mind, unfortunately, it's one of those cases in which academics, for instance, uh, have been pushing for metropolitan structures for a really long time. But the cooperation between um, governments that even politically have been really much in tension um, has not allowed that, except for like some really pressing topics like water, for instance, uh, but not, not in a more systematic uh, manner, I would say. Uh, that's why Guadalajara, of course, a much less fragmented, but still uh, over 5 million metropolitan region offers a relatively more optimistic view for, for, um, for cities that are not, not as huge and as complex as Mexico City, perhaps. Great, thank you. And you raised a, an interesting issue there about boundaries, about the geographic boundaries of metropolitan areas. And we could spend a whole hour just talking about that. And I have often written that very rarely uh, do the, the uh, geographic boundaries of these metropolitan areas get reflected in the political boundaries. In other words, there's lots of things going on beyond the geographic boundary. The one exception we always talk about, of course, is Cape Town, uh, which actually is a metropolitan area uh, that that's kind of covers the uh, the economic region, let's say. So, Nico, maybe you'll tell us a bit about that and and uh, all about also the powers and resources. Thank you, Inet. Uh, and first of all, uh, let me also congratulate the Forum of Iterations uh, of the past twenty years. It's done excellent work across the world, and you know, in one sense, just made knowledge available. But in the another uh, part of their activities has always been examining cutting, doing cutting edge research. Uh, and, and the topic that we have today is really the, at, at the cutting edge. So Rupak, uh, congratulations and your team for running such a, a very innovative and, and thought leading organization. Now, the Question then: What powers and financial resources do mega cities need to uh, need to succeed? The assumption is in this question is that there is such a thing as a mega city that can be the bearer of powers and the recipient of financial resources. And this assumption, um, I think, is false. There is only a metropolitan region, 
and, and these metropolitan or the mega cities are like humpback whales. They're on every ocean, every continent. And with the great pectoral fins, they spread in every direction. But they neither fish nor flesh. Mega cities are neither a local authority or a state or a province. They are really just uh, social and economic amorphous entities, not respecting political or governance divisions. And this is the issue that you, you, you mentioned with uh, reference to Cape Town. Here we have a city of Cape Town. Uh, it covers the entire uh, functional area of it, but it's only 4 million people. When the real problem starts is in our province of Gauteng. There, it's a population of, of 12 million people. The majority of them are living in three con, con, uh, metropolitan uh, municipalities, Chikpabjau. And collectively, they are over 10 million people. But the thought was that they are simply two, uh, that they could not never be joined uh, as one metro because then there would be nothing left of the, of the province. So it immediately highlights size as the key issue, is how do you manage 10 million people when they are neither a metro or a, a municipality nor a province? And these mega cities is really, it doesn't fit in with any federal model. So the real task is, uh, for mega cities themselves to be bearer of powers and to receive um, uh, funds, you want to throw a bed sheet of government over this whale of a people. And most often the people are not having a whale of a time. So what are the options with these? The single uh, metropolitan government, like in Cape Town, but cannot grow into to 10 million, then you lose the connection with the people. Then um, uh, the multi-level metro region, where you have a combination of two levels, one will be the metro level, and the others would be municipalities on the, at the grassroots. And, and there's been some experiments about, around that across the world. And then you could also have single purpose regional authorities, which only focuses on one thing like transport or water or uh, electricity. Um, but often if they only do a single purpose, there is no space for a for trade offs between planning, land use planning, where to place people closer to their work, where you need from housing, the trade off with transport. And the last uh, possibility is that of uh, let the state or province run the region because it expands over the natural boundaries of, of the, not the natural, the, the political boundaries of municipalities. Um, well, the other possibility is that you have no governance structure, but simply strong cooperative models comprising of the metros, the states, and also the central government, each with distinct roles and responsibilities, but that they coordinate their activities in a more cooperative way and a coordinated way. And this is then run by intergovernmental agreements and one will then ask, you know, uh, let there be less partners, i.e. you consolidate local municipalities as far as you can. Um, what are the constraints? Why is this not happening? And as you, you rightly point out, is that metropolitan governments themselves are challenges to states because they are powerful, they've got money, and often are springboards for politicians. And the response to in, in many countries has been keep metropolitan areas carved up in small bits 
small municipalities and that the state actually does the running, does the organization of metros. And, and Australia here is a very strong example. Uh, you just take the uh, Sid Sydney, biggest metropolitan region or area in, in Australia. It hosted the Sydney Olympics, but the municipality of Sydney called Sydney didn't, uh, I don't think, I think the marathon uh, route ran through this through that municipality. Um, it was not a municipal affair. It was done by uh, the state. And the same you have in, in Melbourne, where the state runs the uh, underground railway system. Um, but then funny enough, metropolitan when you get metropolitan regions, which extend over the boundaries um, of even large consolidated areas, states come back again because they can then say between large metropolitan cities, which are or municipalities, which are part of one region, they then become the organizing coordinating body. So let me stop there to say, well, we first, before we can go further, is to look at what are the, the mechanisms, the, the governance mechanisms to make it work. Because they have to do, do two things, a mega city. Make the cities livable, providing basic services and also humane livable spaces. And the second thing is to make them productive provide the economic infrastructure by transport, water, and so forth. Thanks. Thank you. And Jonathan, you were nodding there. I may give you a chance to respond to some of the things that Nico was saying about, about uh, the threat to national government and how they don't want large consolidated uh, areas. Um, likening megacities to Wales is definitely a new one for me, Nico. <laughs> I, I will I will definitely think about that one. Um, but your point about, you know, if we have these big structures, uh, what's left of the province? You know, in a federal system, if, if we take the major cities out of the province or, or, or make them very powerful, then then what what else do you have? But Jonathan, did you want to comment on on, you know, how the national government responds to large cities and um how they feel about them? Well, um, I agree. <laughs> I agree with what uh, Nico said about um, resistance on the part of some from, from, from the government to create a metropolitan system or a single metropolitan government in a mega city because they are sp uh, springboards for national office. You know, if you are the uh, mayor or governor of a large metropolitan area that gives you tremendous exposure on the political end and it gives you national attention. So there's always resistance from the national government or from the federal government to creating this um, large uh, single metropolitan governments that run mega cities. And, and that has been a challenge also in the Philippines because just like what was mentioned in, in the many other mega cities in the world, uh, local government jurisdictions, they are fragmented. Um, mega cities have multiple jurisdictions, which makes it difficult for governance. And that is a uh, bigger challenge. It's, that's a big challenge to mega cities everywhere. And of course, there's also the challenge um, of giving money to the large cities because the smaller uh, perhaps more rural municipalities feel that the large cities are already very rich, have a bit much bigger tax base than they do. And why is the national government giving them money uh, rather than the, the smaller places? So that's another tension that we see. Um, before I go on to the next question, could I remind the audience that uh, you can also ask questions. Uh, again, if you're on YouTube, uh, put them into the chat. If you're on Facebook, put them into the comment section and we'll try to get to your questions. Um, so my next question is, in a multi-level governance system, 
What mechanisms can be used to get all three orders of government, federal, state, and local, to collaborate on issues that affect megacities? And I'm particularly interested in some good examples from around the world about meaningful intergovernmental collaboration in federal countries. And as part of that question, I'd also like you to talk about how megacities can balance regional and local interests. So if again, if there's a large metropolitan region, uh, there are regional issues, perhaps transportation, land use planning, but there are also very local issues like parks and libraries and uh, fire protection. And how do, how do you balance those? So Jonathan, we'll start with you again. Yes, thank you for the question. I would think that the evolution of cities require policies that focus on the entire urbanization process rather than on individual cities. You know, the notion of a system of cities, it acknowledges that it is the relationship among cities, their comparative and complementary expertise and their evolution in relation to other urban areas that should be the focus of policy. So um, in the case of the Philippines, uh, in particular, Metropolitan Manila, but we do have another one, Metropolitan Cebu in the middle in the Visayas and down south, Metropolitan Davao, but Metropolitan Manila is the biggest. We tend to um, utilize the mechanism of a coordinating body. Because as I mentioned in my previous statement, we have it has been virtually impossible for us to create a single metropolitan uh, governance system for the Metropolitan Manila. So we have what is a coordinating body called the Metro Manila Development Authority. And this authority has limited functions, uh, mostly garbage collection, traffic, you know, um, uh, but because of, and, 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 and some limited, some limited uh, powers, because most of the powers are with the uh, municipal jurisdictions. And however, the COVID pandemic has forced people, has forced governments to reinvent themselves because uh, in a metropolitan city, you may live in one jurisdiction, but work in another jurisdiction. And issues like where will you be vaccinated? Should, be, should you be vaccinated in your place of work or in your place of residence? Okay, uh, where will you be tested? Uh, curfew hours, for example, we have curfew hours in the Philippines. We cannot have a curfew uh, in, for example, uh, Quezon City at six o'clock when the workers come from outside of Quezon City. The moment they arrive in Quezon City, it will rarely be curfew. So this forced the mayors <laughs> to work together closely and they utilized what is called as the coordinating body called the MMDA. Um, they, they meet very regularly, um, uh, almost every week. Before they wouldn't meet. They, meet, they would meet perhaps once a month or once every two months. But because of the COVID-19 pandemic, they had to work together more closely and ensure that the COVID does not spread. Because one single entity in a mega city that doesn't do its job will create super spreader events that will affect everyone. So things like uh, coordinating hospital beds were done on the uh, Metropolitan Manila Development Authority level. The, the, the different jurisdictions would give reports on how many hospital beds were, were, were available. And the uh, coordinating body would get calls and they would tell the patient where to go. Because it's possible that you're living in one jurisdiction, but the available hospital is in another jurisdiction. So, uh, and another thing is contact tracing. You know, you live in one jurisdiction, but you work in another, and then you spread the COVID in that place. So if, if uh, people are mixing, how do you then contact trace these individuals if they live in different places? So this forced the mayors to uh, work closely together. So the mechanism that we find very useful 
is this because we don't have, as I said, a, gov a single governmental system. It allowed the municipal jurisdictions to cooperate. It ensures that there are uh, the same policies that apply. So if, if the city of Manila requires a face mask, all the mayors have to agree that they re will require a face mask. Or if one mayor requires a face shield, everybody has to agree. And the coordinating body also became the bridge between the national government and the local government units. Because for example, in the vaccination program, the vaccines can only come from the federal or the national government. So uh, the federal government or the national government does not have uh, people to do the vaccination on the ground. So the vaccines have to be transferred to the local government units and you will have to coordinate everyone to make sure that the vaccination rollout uh, happens. So the Metropolitan Manila Deve Development Authority has somewhat evolved uh, because of the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. But having mentioned that, I think there is one gap that uh, this system does not um, address, which is the challenge of urban planning. Because urban planning is done on a municipal level, there is no clear coordination among the jurisdictions on how urban development is to happen. If the national government doesn't come in and impose some policies, each of the municipal jurisdiction will do whatever they want. And what happens is an urban sprawl, an uncontrolled growth, which is a facet of many uh, mega cities, not only in Asia, but across the world. Great, thank you. And it's interesting that you raised COVID and um, because we do have a question about that, which we'll get to shortly, but we've certainly seen around the world cooperation happening where it has never happened before, both within metropolitan areas and between uh, local governments and uh, state or provincial and national governments. And we've certainly seen it here in Canada, um, a, a lot of cooperation, collaboration, uh, very informal. Uh, it's interesting that you have this um, Metro Municipal Development Authority, which was a body that already existed that you could work through um, to, to address the pandemic. So that, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, Alejandra? Sure. Um, so um, I'll start by, by mentioning a couple of, um, of sort of like broad uh, ideas, although I, as I mentioned before, I, I do want to focus on two cases in particular that I think uh, might be relatively interesting. Um, one of the things also I think related a little bit to, to the, the previous question and the finances that I failed to mention, but I think might be uh, interesting to discuss uh, right now as well is how um, the push for metropolitan uh, governance has sometimes happened sort of in a bottom up, um, sometimes in a top down and sometimes in a bottom up fashion, uh, so meaning it's been pushed either like, well, in, in the cases that I'm most familiar with uh, in the US and, and Mexico, um, ha they have either been pushed by some state governments um, and, and uh, even federal governments. I'll, I'll talk in a second of, of, of why that was uh, versus uh, more sort of like either uh, local le legislative and citizen pushes uh, for like in the case of Guadalajara uh, for for implementing metropolitan governance and and the implications of of that. Although the the Guadalajara case, I think it's it's relatively um, recent, uh, but it was consolidated about ten years ago. So so we still um, as as far as, as, as we, as much as we see it as a success case at the national level, uh, we are always a little bit hesitant to, to, to see if it's, it's going to continue uh, in a more permanent basis. Um, but on the balancing of, of interest, interests, um, I think, again, um, there's some challenges uh, related to, to power dynamics, issues of representation, and, and ultimately uh, the fostering of, of more democratic outcomes. Um, that can come out of, of, of metropolitan collaboration. Um, and, and here, um, there's, uh, especially within 
discussions about governance, there, there's, there's an argument for how civic engagement can be paramount, uh, not, not only due to sort of like ethical or moral considerations, but, but to actually ensure accountability of, of these sort of like levels of government that are not um, totally consolidated or that rely on, 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 on electoral representation, for instance. Uh, but, but again, uh, sort of emphasizing how um, municipalities also, especially sort of more powerful and, and wealthier ones, um, usually perhaps need to be willing to give up powers um, to partner up with neighbor, neighboring municipalities uh, to make front to challenges that they cannot effectively tackle alone. Um, on the ground, unfortunately, I think historically, um, uh, metropolitan regions have had to face incredible pressures to be able to cooperate. So, so sometimes uh, they don't do it in, in for instance, uh, as it was mentioned, um, planning or land use uh, management. Um, and so the, the, the types of um, sort of multi-level um, or intergovernmental uh, collaboration that I'll be talking about um, has to do with uh, that creation of metropolitan um, authorities. So sort of in between your sort of like light structures of, of intermunicipal coordination, like committees, commissions, uh, working groups, uh, councils or advisory platforms, but of course not as, as, as strong as uh, regional or consolidated governments um, through annexation or, or amalgamation. Um, but, but for these sort of like middle level um, metropolitan authorities um, to quote unquote uh, succeed, although that's, that's um, not a very clear uh, definition, um, uh, arguably uh, the, the clarity of the initial agreements and objectives, um, it's, it's important, but I would argue that even more than that, uh, implementation and oversight um, are very important as well. And so I'll start with um, sort of the case of the US and, and one of the topics that I study the most, it, it's housing. And, and that's one of the, of the topics that actually, I think it's been really hard to, to foster regional collaboration. But after the civil rights movement um, of the 60s here in the US, there, are, there was actually a federal level um, and after the Federal Housing Act, uh, push to promote metropolitan coordination, uh, to promote housing desegregation at the local level uh, because of, of how prevalent um, exclusionary zoning um, it continues to be actually to this day in the US. Uh, one of the failures was that there was always limited funding um, and enforcement. And so really these councils of government um, became a, a sort of fringe local initiative based on, on interest and commitment at the local level. Uh, but in the case of California, and here it's where sometimes like the top down versus bottom up nature, like there's mixed results, I think, on, on how effective uh, one or other can be. Because uh, the, the California government actually really, I think, has supported this, these councils of government quite strongly. And uh, because of that reason, they have remained active to this day. Um, they, they are very importantly funded by state and, and, and federal uh, funding. Um, but the, but the, the case of California, and, and it's interesting to me because it's one that, I, that I'm studying at the moment, it's that that goal to, to promote a fair distribution of housing density and affordability uh, throughout for instance, um, and I want to specifically talk about the Southern California Association of Governments um, that includes the, the city of LA, but also, uh, so to add a layer of complication in the US, we, we don't only have cities, we have, well, we have cities, we have counties and then the states. Um, and so, and, and, and for instance, LA County has 88 cities, a lot of unincorporated areas. And so, so we have had a very uneven distribution of, of development uh, over the years that the state, so, so especially in, re, in redistributive um, matters, the state has actually always been um, sort of pushing uh, local governments 
actually to, to sort of um, limit uh, their exclusionary zoning uh, patterns. Unfortunately, with not too much success until a few years ago, a uh, series of legislation actually gave teeth uh, to, to, um, to, to a series of um, uh, laws at the state level um, that may actually even limit local zoning jurisdictions at the local level, right? Because we have like certain cities, like you would know, like perhaps Beverly Hills, but, but I live for instance in Orange County, which is also a, a fairly wealthy area to the south of, of LA, uh, who has historically sort of uh, um, promoted very low density development and also very uh, exclusive um, uh, types of development affecting of course the entire region. Um, and second, I'll quickly talk about, as I mentioned, um, a Metropolitan Planning Institute in, in uh, Guadalajara, Jalisco, which, which as I mentioned, it's the second largest city in, in, in Mexico. And, and the, the reason why this, um, this I think it uh, presents an, an interesting example, it's because similar institutes had emerged in, in the Mexican context, but generally they were restricted to doing research and provide recommendations. Uh, they really didn't have much authority. And in this case, it was both the state legislature um, and, and, and member, like a, a particular member of the state legi legislature that um, later became the governor, but also some civic um, society initiatives that promoted legal changes in the local regulatory framework um, to allow this institute to, to have uh, more, more powers and capacities. Um, and so this happened um, between 20, uh, 2009 and, and uh, 2012. Um, and, and later it actually even became a model um, for, for, for this sort of uh, scheme of, of intermediate governance between sort of like the municipal and the state level um, so that at the federal level, there was the, the, the passage of a law of human settlements, uh, land management and urban development that gives um, metropolitan regions in Mexico actually the, the possibility of conforming uh, similar institutes. Now, whether they will do that, I mean, some cities, some intermediate cities have done that. I, I know that a place like Mexico City will perhaps never enter into, into that arrangement, unfortunately. Um, so one of the, and, and I think this speaks a little bit to, to, the, to the topic of, of balancing interests, is that um, a characteristic that has emerged, it's that um, the state government and large core municipalities tend to be very influential on agenda setting priorities because they, they actually have the resources to do so. Um, although all municipalities do have the same voting power. Um, so um, the other uh, quick things that I, that I would like to mention about the, this Metropolitan Planning Institute in Guadalajara, it's that um, it, it mainly centers on improving service and infrastructure provision, uh, managing growth and, and, and risk, um, along with a couple of other environmental and socioeconomic considerations. Um, and it is the one that has entered into agreements with bodies such as uh, human rights commissions and, and UN Habitat, for instance. Um, but uh, it's largely financed to, to, to return a little bit to, to the previous uh, question by, by, the, by a trust financed by the state. Although there was um, some federal funds in previous years that, that also helped it. Um, and the idea of proportional municipal con uh, contributions um, proportional to their sizes. Um, but, but this was largely unsuccessful because of what I mentioned of how, unfortunately, municipal finances in Mexico are, are really, really uh, weak. Um, and, and lastly, I, I would say uh, really in, in, in the Guadalajara case, uh, metropolitan governance even goes, I, I think, a little bit beyond this institute um, because the state, but again, it was the state actually who promoted, who, which has promoted and sustained a lot of these uh, uh, laws that have promoted coordination uh, by a metropolitan uh, board 
uh, that's composed by, by this institute, but also mayors, uh, the governor, um, and a Metropolitan Citizens Council, uh, as well as a Metropolitan Planning um, Advisory Council. So, so I, I do think that it presents a relatively interesting um, case study to discuss. Thank you. Those are really interesting case studies, both from the US and from Mexico. And it's interesting to think about top down structures that are imposed on municipalities that they are forced to enter into versus bottom up, more collaborative, voluntary uh, bodies. And can, and can that lead to something more formal uh, going forward? Uh, Nico. You're on mute. Nico? Uh, repeat the words of, uh, of wisdom. <laughs> From my early remarks, one can safely say that there, there, there is no, to my knowledge, a political structure called a mega city or that, that really captures a 10 million people entity called a mega city. So, and it is not possible to do it either because um, most often it spreads across municipal boundaries, but also provincial boundaries. So the only real way forward is the cooperative model of, of intergovernment relations, agreements, structures that can try to bring together through agreements, um, the, the alignment of, of policies. Um, and I think uh, uh, Jonathan is saying is key is land use planning. Uh, the other day I listened to, to Paul Collier and he said, it is extremely costly to make sense and to organize metro these huge mega cities after people have arrived because everything must be, be ripped up. Much cheaper is to plan it beforehand and await arrival. Because as we know, in most of, 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 of the global South, the process of urbanization has just commenced. The big cities, the big uh, mega cities of the world will be in, in, uh, in the global South. So it is that forward planning. And so the question is, how do you establish these intergovernmental structures that functions effectively and uh, can bring everyone together? Now, there's one or two examples uh, that didn't work very well. The one is, is, is in uh, Brazil, where the national government said that passed a law which allowed for metropolitan regions larger than the, 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 the metros. And it was more of an imposition from the top through the states on municipalities. And there wasn't great buy-in. And that body, the Metropolitan Region Council, I think never uh, had much support. So it's a question again of style, of uh, inclusiveness. How do you build this? And you know, and again, talking Brazil, is how do you cross political boundaries or, or party political interest? Because very often if there's differences uh, and, and we look at the US, that's just the end of, of any cooperation uh, to, to much to the damage of, of, of the citizens. Um, an interesting example comes from South Africa about how this notion of planning and the built of infrastructure, which is in the ground, the, the basis for economic development is being viewed. On a national level, there was a, created by statute, a, a council for uh, infrastructure development. And this council as a statutory body comprised of uh, the president and one or two ministers, or the premiers of the nine uh, provinces and the mayors of the eight metropolitan municipalities with equal voting rights. So there you got an elevation of your mayors to the level of premiers. 
to say, and, and, the, and it was simple, the big infrastructure projects are going to be taking place in the cities where they hold sway, where they actually can go out and borrow money um, and so forth. So it is a way, and, and one can do it then obviously not just simply at a national level, but in each mega city is creating these, uh, these, these uh, intergovernmental structures with tight uh, 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 rules of, of engagement, of, of uh, commitment to, to, to overall planning that will bring out uh, and make sure that there is alignment. And there are so many, as, as we just heard from, the, from Manila, the greater Manila, the difficulties of aligning with COVID. I think the, the latest dispute in terms of COVID was, ah, working from home. Now, where do you tax the people? At home, where they work, but the work is done uh, in, 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 a, in another metropolitan, uh, in another, uh, metropolitan uh, city or, or government. So th these are the issues that required, obviously, coordination of, of even taxing. Uh, uh, which is vital for, for any metro. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, we do have some questions from the audience. I have more questions too, but um, I have one just detailed question for you, Jonathan, and then I wanna ask Alejandra and Nico about the pandemic because Jonathan's already talked about this. Uh, but Jonathan, the question for you is how much is the own source revenue of Metro Manila as a percentage of its total expenditure requirement? You'll need to unmute. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's it's almost 50-50. No, it's almost it's very surprising. Uh, own source, which is mostly real property taxes and um, business taxes is almost half or, or around that compared to fiscal transfers from the national government. But given the unprecedented requirement of uh, the pandemic, the national government was forced to provide more uh, fiscal transfers to, to, to pay for uh, isolation facilities, for additional hospital beds, for COVID patients, for increased testing, uh, for and now for um, expenses related to vaccination. Uh, in the beginning, um, there was a shortage of uh, personal protective equipment that the national government gave the local governments money. In fact, uh, procurements were made on the national level. And once the PPEs were available, they were transferred and, uh, and given to the local governments so that the local governments does not need to procure anymore. So uh, there was a substantial uh, fiscal transfers beyond what is normal during a pandemic. Uh, there has been two episodes of total lockdown in the Philippines. And in, at, uh, at each instance, the national government gave funds for direct cash transfers to the people who lost their jobs. Okay, So uh, this was substantial. Just, just a few, we, we just finished right now distributing 22.9 billion pesos to 22 million uh, Filipinos in the greater Manila area. Because when you talk about metropolitan Manila, that's 17 cities, but the residents of the neighboring provinces, they come to work in Manila. So if you shut down Manila, you're shutting down additional four provinces. So the national government had to pay uh, to give financial assistance to all of these people who lost their jobs for two weeks. Okay, so uh, that required additional cash infusions again from the national government to the uh, municipal jurisdictions so that they can assist their constituents in this pandemic. So the short answer to the question is it's about 50-50, but during the pandemic, it's been a lot more uh, transfers than own source revenue just because of the, the emergency. Um, so. Uh, to Alejandra and Nico, there's been a question about the pandemic, and the question is, uh, what should be the role of metropolitan governance during a pandemic like the COVID-19 outbreak? Alejandra, do you want to? 
Sure. Um, yeah, and I, I wonder how much to answer what it should be and what it actually is, or, or I know it has been. Perhaps you could do both. <laughs> both. Yeah, um, uh, especially in the cases that I've, I've talked about, because one of the things that I know it's uh, in, in the Guadalajara case, for instance, uh, it's that um, the funding, the federal funding actually that came. So as I mentioned, the state government is fairly committed to these sort of like metropolitan governance structures that have emerged in, in the local case. Uh, but the federal government actually um, reduced uh, or, or actually uh, stopped um, providing funding precisely because of the pandemic, it just didn't, um, to these metropolitan uh, institutes, um, it just didn't perceive it to be sort of like a priority under current uh, economic circumstances. Um, on the other hand, um, one of the things that I, I think I perhaps failed to, to mention, for instance, in, in, in the Southern California Association of Governments case, it's that while uh, federal and state level mandates have actually pushed uh, these councils of governments to be uh, more inclusive uh, and, 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 and to, to, to aim at, at, at certain uh, sort of redistributive um, policies, they, they have pr primarily, I think, been able to coalesce around uh, topics of transportation. Um, however, I think that the pandemic has really brought to the forefront housing struggles in, in, in the region, which are, are very considerable. Um, and so I think this has actually helped. I mean, it, it's, it's been a bit mixed. Um, it has actually helped uh, because during our last very contentious elections, actually, there's, there were several uh, ballot measures related to housing that, that actually didn't pass. Um, but but I but I think there has been an important push uh, to recognize, and, and and I would I I think I would link this again to to a, a bit of the of the housing conversation because it's not disconnected from the land use conversation, um, and even the transportation one, right? Like a lot of housing advocates and organizations have been had been uh, telling even the Southern California Association of Government that with current uh, densities in in LA, I mean we we know to be uh, one of the, like the lowest, one of the lowest uh, density metros in, in the globe. But even if, if, if you go to the suburbs like Orange County, uh, densities are much lower. And, and we know that without those densities, uh, transportation infrastructure, is just economically not feasible. Um, so um, so, so I, I, I'll try to wrap it up by, by saying that, uh, uh, by focusing on, on, on how the pandemic, uh, and of course, this, this, is, is, this is a lot of, 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 of what my work uh, revolves around, uh, I think it, it, it has put in the forefront the, the importance of, of housing security, uh, which is something that I think we're struggling at, at a global level. And I think that lack of coordination and that extreme competition between local governments to sort of attract the most profitable uses um, has has really been been detrimental in 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 uh, promoting the development of more inclusive but also sustainable cities, um, and and I think that that relates both to environmental challenges that we face, uh, socioeconomic, and, and even now uh, with the pandemic. Okay, thank you, uh, Nico. Uh, what's the role of metropolitan governance during the pandemic? Varied, um, but I think across the world, you've seen that they actually came to the fore. And in, um, and it starts obviously with what is the division of powers and functions uh, and who is responsible for, for healthcare. And usually, say in South Africa, it was this, this, uh, the provinces and the national government and only clinics for, for municipalities. But when it comes to the, the details of governing, of social distancing, of uh, providing shelter, 
for the homeless quarantine sites. There, there must be a place. Uh, then suddenly metros came, came to the fore and said, we are able with our resources to do so. And um, unlike uh, in, in, in Manila, uh, the, the metros in South Africa raised 90% of their income through the trading services of electricity and water. And uh, the less than 20% is only from, from uh, property taxes. So they were hit by the uh, pandemic because of the trading services dropped and they couldn't slow, uh, let go of providing water and electricity to keep everyone going. So it was suddenly seen that in a pandemic, which you make big policy issues about COVID distribution, et cetera, but somewhere there must be a town hall, there must, there must be uh, the detail of managing people's lives, where they can walk, where they can have recreation. These were very localized. And it again reinforced um, the and where the most people lived. And because of the identity of, 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 of metros, where the, the disease spread the most is that and the persons who feel it directly were, in fact, the metro governments. And, and overall, I think uh, they've shown that it's, it's, a, it's a vital role that they played in, in, in meeting the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Well, I, I can add in Canada that um, uh, it, it's been an interesting time. Uh, the federal government, of course, has been procuring vaccines. Provincial governments distribute them, and, and then the, the local governments actually put the, the needles in the arms, or at least the, the health professionals do. Um, so, so there's been a lot of uh, collaboration and coordination that's been unprecedented. Uh, at the metro level, um, you know, in Toronto, which is a city of almost 3 million people in a region of about 6 million people with a number of municipalities around it, there's no formal governance structure to cover that region. We've talked about it for years, but there isn't one. Um, but the mayors and the city managers of each of the municipalities have gotten together to talk about some of the things that obviously spill over municipal boundaries, public health issues, transportation issues. And there's been an informal collaboration that has been quite successful. Um, but then again, no, no metropolitan structure uh, to, to address it. Um, we're getting questions from the audience, so let me pose another one to the panel. And this is an interesting question because megacities are huge, and I described a lot of the problems that megacities have. And the question is, what would be fundamental public policy instrument, instruments to keep a reasonable size of cities that are able to provide well-being to society? Considering the attraction and movement of people to megacities, so everybody wants to go to megacities. Megacities have a lot of problems. Are there policy instruments to keep the size of cities at a more reasonable level? And if anyone wants to jump in, or Jonathan, do you want to start? Okay, uh, I, I would think it would be very difficult uh, for any policy instrument to be passed either by statute or executive fiat, limiting the size of a megacity. Because as mentioned, megacities, were not created to become megacities. They were not megacities in the beginning. They were small entities that grew and grew and grew as a result of uh, the success of the megacity itself. So we, we find this in many parts of the world. Um, they, they began as small villages that through time grew larger and larger, which then um, overcome the original political boundaries. So I think the megacities are a victim of their own success. So the only way to limit the size of a megacity is for the megacities to not, to not be as successful as they are. Because people will always be, but people will always be attracted to a megacity. However, the pandemic has changed somewhat the demographics because um, we have seen, for example, in, this, in, the, in, in Mega Manila, because Mega Manila is the center of gravity of the pandemic. Many people went, went out <laughs> and moved out uh, to the provinces to escape the pandemic. So 
um, we have this program in the country now, which um, is, is a program of resettlement. And a lot of people are, um, that, that, that were once attracted to the lights of the city um, have availed of this program. And we have, pilot, uh, pro, we have pilot provinces that are willing to take back their uh, residents who, are, who come from uh, the, me the mega city. So uh, as I said, you know, uh, the pandemic has somewhat changed, um, has, has, um, has forced, you know, has, has changed a lot of the, uh, of the, of how we govern. And even those we govern have somehow moved, uh, have, have gone out of uh, the mega city because of this, but uh, because of the pandemic. And I think that's a phenomenon we're seeing around the world. We're certainly seeing it here in Canada. There is a bit of a movement out of the big cities to the surrounding municipalities. I question what the long run impact will be, uh, whether that will continue, uh, that trend, that movement out of the big cities, or whether people will, after the pandemic is over, come back. And I guess it depends a lot on the work from home uh, that's going to happen. I mean, now people are working from home. Uh, many people are, when people actually go back to their offices, uh, will they want to move back to the city? But you mentioned that, that there's a pilot program for getting people to go back out to the provinces. Are there some incentives provided to people to move? What, what is the pilot exactly? Yes, we do. There, 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 it's, it's called Balik Provincia, which means go back to your province because in a mega city, you most of the people they are not from there. <laughs> they're they're migrants, so to speak. You know, um, so um, we have this program wherein people can avail of government assistance to go back to their um, hometown, so to speak. So it comes with uh, some cash assistance. There is transportation allowance given. So the transportation going back is, is paid for by government, and. Uh, the local governments or the provincial governments are the ones that take charge of providing um, livelihood assistance or help them find a job. It's a big challenge, but uh, on a pilot basis, it has been uh, successful. Uh, but once more people avail of this program, I think it's going to uh, face uh, more challenges, but at least uh, we have seen it work in one or two provinces, and we hope to uh, increase the number of provinces as we go along. Okay, thank you. Alejandra, um, I don't know if you wanna comment in the US or in Mexico, but uh, go ahead. Sure, uh, I, th I think uh, a notable example I think can be drawn um, from the Mexican case actually in, in, in this case. Um, of course, I mean, Unfortunately, or I mean, uh, uh, several decades ago, at, at a time when we had a much more centralized, I think, um, a governance structure in, in the entire country. And so sort of executive decisions were, were much easier to, to implement. But there was actually a decentralization effort uh, that, that, that happened in Mexico when, when there was a recognition that Mexico City in a way was getting saturated um, parts of, of that effort, I would say, were successful in promoting the growth of other cities, like uh, as some of you might be familiar with Monterrey, third largest city in, in northern Mexico, but also some, some parts of, of what we call El Bajío, which is sort of uh, central, uh, central Mexico cities like uh, um, also became industrial hubs. Uh, the case in which perhaps it was um, like the unintended consequences weren't as, as positive was that there was also a big push to uh, decentralize industry away from Mexico City core into uh, uh, Estado de Mexico, like the state of Mexico, which now houses a lot of the metropolitan region of, of, of Mexico City. And so whether that actually uh, uh, fueled sprawl in a way, uh, uh, perhaps it did. Now, there, we, we also have some of the natural pushes away uh, from cities when, when sort of like congestion becomes a really big problem that, that definitely happened uh, in places like, like Mexico City uh, um, or when, when there's a lot of insecurity. Um, 
and uh, there was there's there was of course of course that 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 suburbanization phase that that the U.S. also experienced, uh, sort of that that um, move away from the city, of course, uh, uh, mostly only uh, by 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 white uh, families, but but right now I would say. Um, again, to bring the topic that's that's closest to 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 what I do, uh, I think housing prices. It's one of the things that's really pushing people away from cities. Uh, it, it's it's a real concern, especially from big cities. We we know that here in California, in San Francisco, for instance, those are the type of places that that have uh, seen a, a sort of um, increasing vacancy rates after the pandemic. Um, but even before then, I, th I think places in California, uh, like people were actually moving away from California just because of how prohibitively expensive it is to live here. Um, so, th so those are uh, sort of my two cents on, on, on that uh, topic. Thank you. So some, some of it is happening because of the market, right? So the housing prices are going up, so people are just moving. Uh, and, and some of it is an effort at decentralization. Nico, what about in South Africa? Perhaps also a bit looking a bit broader, um, we see that, as I said, this urbanization going to take place. Um, in Africa and elsewhere in the South, uh, it's still low, under 50%, and till you reach an average of between 75 and 80, whatever, that becomes sort of a stabilized around there. Now, there's no way that you can stop uh, free movement of people. Uh, it's simply the market that attracts, services attract, and they will follow. The only way that one can reduce the attraction of one place, and, and, and that's been a major problem in Africa, it's the capital city, where all the services are, where, where the main attraction is, is through then state intervention by creating infrastructure, investment in other nodes. So not stopping uh, urbanization, but trying to see whether it could have been better spread the investment rather than having everything at the capital mega city. Um, and, and this has been one of the primary reasons where a federal approach to governance has been very popular uh, in Africa to say, this is a way in which at least state investment are spread across regions and not only in a unitary state, that's where the capital is. So it's the investment of different nodes, which could eventually through the market, it's not the state, it's the market that will attract people if it becomes viable op opportunities. Uh, uh, across a country with a number of mega cities rather than a super mega city in one place. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned capital cities and somebody's asked a question about Canada. Uh, could uh, you please explain some experience of the National Capital Region Commission, how it coordinates two cities in Canada's federation? I'm not going to pose that question to you on the panel, uh, but as a Canadian, um, I, I, I could perhaps answer that one. Um, I, I want to start by saying that, that the former federation many years ago published a book on capital cities and federal systems, and that was my first time uh, working with the forum, and so I, I recommend that book to you. Some things have changed since then, but it's, um, uh, it, it's still a very good book on, on the different governance models for capital cities, like whether it's a federal district like uh, Washington or, or Canberra in Australia, whether it's a city-state like in Berlin, uh, or whether it's just a, a single tier city in a province. And in the case of Canada, the capital city is Ottawa, and it is, is simply a city uh, in a province like any other city. Uh, the Ottawa region or the national capital region spans two provinces with the city of Ottawa and Gatineau on the other side of the river in Quebec. The National Capital Commission um, it is really uh, about you know, beautifying the capital city and it owns a lot of uh, land and property and, um, and and that's mainly what it does. But but there's often, often tensions between 
the commission in the city on who, you know, who's doing the land use planning. So I, I'm just going to refer you to our book um, on, on capital cities and federal systems uh, for more information on that. Um, so turning back to, to the panel, in the case of conflict between the provincial or state government and the local government in metropolitan areas, how do you ensure the delivery of services? So when the, 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 there's a conflict between the provincial and the local governments, how, how does that get resolved? Jonathan, I don't know if that applies to you. Yes, we do. Uh, okay. but, we don't, but, but we don't have a state government, but we do have the, the national government. So the tension is always there. Um, I would try to answer that question. There's, there's always two approaches, the hard approach and the soft approach. The hard approach is uh, threatening legal action <laughs> against the uh, local government for not uh, delivering the basic service that is uh, uh, in question. The, uh, the soft approach is the more collaborative and cooperative approach wherein you call the attention of the local government. You try to provide technical assistance um, and uh, provide the necessary intervention so that the delivery can be, so that the service can be delivered to the constituents. Because at the end of the day, uh, the constituents are the same, whether it be a higher level government or a lower, gov uh, lower level government, because the constituents um, are the same and they are all voters. So uh, it is to the, it is to the um, interest of both that a solution is, is found, but it would depend on the circumstances, whether a hard approach or a soft approach is uh, proper. And that leads me into a question about constitutions, but we'll come back to that. Um, Alejandra? Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I don't know if I have too much to add. Uh, the, the one thing, um, I mean, the, the question is surprising in the sense that uh, I, I do consider Mexico to be historically, unfortunately, a relatively like a known place to be um, where political tensions really limit political uh, like cooperation between different levels of government. But in my mind, it has never crossed the threshold of, of uh, limiting service provision, right? Like I know that that generally governments tend to l let go of their difference in really pressing circumstances related to precisely uh, water provision, um, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, yeah, uh, other matters that are central. Like where, where I see tensions really be very detrimental, it's where on, on cases in which uh, cooperation is not sort of urgent, uh, like immediately urgent, as sometimes uh, land use has been, for instance, uh, where, where perhaps the implications of, of that lack of cooperation um, will lead to long-term uh, negative implications, but not immediate ones. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think that's, that's all I, I would have to, to say about that. Okay, thank you. Um, Nico. You know, you know, you can create structures, you can create procedures, uh, all nice things in law, but in the end, it's, it's really the political culture. And we have remarkable you know, evidence coming out of the US about conflicts between governors and mayors. Now, if the one is a Democrat and the other one is a Republican, they were not cooperating. And the, if it's the other way around, the same, same, same happened. And it happened about the policies on COVID, with its mask wearing, with its social distancing, with stay at home orders, and so on. So uh, the more difficult question is how do you build a, and, and we see that, you know, the US may, is, is one of the exceptions, the building of a more political coherence around the common, common issue. And obviously, uh, COVID was a very hard, real, and 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 deadly issue to confront it. Um, and so people will work together. And political parties will start sharing. Um, now, one will just have to say, well, that same uh, political culture that was developing, why not apply it again to social services, delivery of services, 
um, and in the end, it, it's it's the voter, it's the it's the recipient, it's the the, the um, citizens who who want to say, well, you know, you can't. Uh, you we 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 are if if we're going to suffer by a lack of services. Thanks. Okay, so you know, in the Canadian context, um, uh, local governments are uh, in the constitution as a responsibility of the provinces. So the constitution sets out the federal responsibilities, provincial responsibilities, and under provincial responsibilities uh, are municipal governments. So when there is that tension between the provincial government and the local government, the provincial government wins. And we've seen a couple of cases of that recently where they've intervened in election procedures and election processes, uh, land use decisions. And, and at the end of the day, um, they, they can do that. So in other countries as well, in other federal countries, the uh, constitution treats cities as creatures of the state or creatures of the province. How important is the constitution for megacities in federal countries? What role does it play with respect to powers, resources, and governance of megacities? And are there some good examples of constitutions that support megacities? I can think of a couple, but um, I'm going to turn it over to the panel. Jonathan? That's a very interesting question. Um, however, I don't have any good example. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, of constitution that supports megacities, at least not in our context, not in the Philippine context, because um, there is no mention of megacities in our constitution. But I would think, I, I would think that if uh, if if megacities are recognized by the constitution, they would benefit. However, that would be a, a big and important step. It's it, it's going to be a big political decision on the part of the policymakers, if they do so. Because uh, when we were discussing uh, a federal constitution for the, the Philippines, uh, one of the big issues was, should Metro Manila have its own governor? Uh, and, and everybody knew that uh, with, with the creation of a metropolitan governance system in Metro Manila, that would be a very important political position. And that political position comes with a lot of funding and power, uh, authority over so many aspects of uh, national political life. But unfortunately, I don't have any good examples <laughs> for, in, for this question in the Philippine context. Okay, thank you. Alejandro, how important is the constitution in all of these discussions? Yeah, I, I guess um, uh, perhaps I would speak of like, I, I would try to go beyond just the federal constitution to also state level constitutions and um, and even legislation sometimes because um, so on the one hand um, and I think even related a bit to the to the previous question um, on on the one hand um, those tensions that tend to exist between different levels of government. Uh, it, in in reality and in something like service provision, I think being 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 a, a good example. Uh, generally, those laws and constitutions will will have to, in theory, resolve those tensions. Um, I would also, I think, uh, what what Enid shared uh, resonated with with um, the Mexican context in particular, uh, in the sense that state uh, authorities generally always trump uh, local uh, sort of uh, capacities. Um, in, in the US case, uh, I would, I would uh, say that, that sometimes uh, state governments, I think, and state constitutions are also very important. And then that's why we have like really different circumstances sometimes uh, in one state and, and, and the next. And it's a little bit hard for me as, as, as well to, to only focus on, on metropolitan or mega city uh, sort of uh, capabilities, but, but I would like to, again, sort of emphasize and mention both the, the changes in, in the law in, 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 at the state level in, in, the, in the Jalisco, which is the state, but Guadalajara case, which actually um, sort of allowed for the formation of these um, of, of, of this Metropolitan Institute that then in 2016 was also 
uh, made into law at the federal level. And so we are seeing how these institutes, I mean, they, they are not as established as the Guadalajara one, uh, but we're, we're seeing how other cities are, are trying to emulate the, the, the Guadalajara Metropolitan Institute making use of this uh, 2016 law of human settlements, land management and urban development. The only thing it's, um, and I know this to be a little bit the case also with the city statute, for instance, in Brazil, sometimes these, these laws, their teeth, they, they, they sort of stay as, as sort of either recommendations or, or options for cities to opt in, um, but not necessarily something that, that leads all, all uh, uh, regions or, or um, metropolitan areas to, to sort of like buy into that, um, that yeah, that model. So, so I think, again, political will, uh, I think, and the push either, either by political actors or, or, or civic movements, um, it's important as well. Thank you. Um, so Nico, when, when I talk about uh, cities and constitutions or cities having original powers and constitutions, I look at Brazil, uh, which Alejandro mentioned, and I look at South Africa. So uh, tell us about the, how the constitution has affected uh, the governance of megacities. Well, we we back to, to, to our original problem of the whale, which is just too big to fit into the three level uh, uh, level of governments, uh, and because cities then could in fact simply be autonomous, uh, they got listed um, powers as 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 Brazil and South Africa and and they play us. But we're really talking about something quite different is, is when they really expand beyond uh, what is, is a local government. And then the option, what the city may do, and this is, uh, or a constitution may do, is say, well, you become a city state. And I already, uh, Jonathan was mentioning that as a possibility for the Philippines. And then the a government, uh, as in Germany, uh, in, in Berlin, is both a government of a state and then they put on a different coat and becomes the government of the municipality of, uh, of Berlin performing those functions. So um, that, that's the only one where they head on can address the mega city. The, the other one, uh, the other way is to... Um, recognize mega city as as an issue that and by recognizing is as importance for development for economic growth and the provision of services um, and almost instruct municipality or all uh, levels of government to cooperate in governing those areas as best as they can where constitution then comes in, and, and, and we just again refer to the basic law, is make provisions specifically for, for clusters of municipalities getting together and performing certain tasks. And that they are brought in, um, if they're too small, they can actually expand. So, so there you have a little handle by which say, for example, in, in, in Gauteng in South Africa, the big three municipalities, uh, metros, um, plus a large local municipalities can form um, joint bodies. They can even give it statutory form to deliver certain services to do, for example, say, well, we collectively through this joint body are going to do planning. And so uh, as long as the, uh, as, as long as your uh, constitution is flexible and open, you can play within it. But to give direct powers into a system that, uh, into this creature, which is not one or the other, I don't think that will, will, will in fact, easily be done within the constitution. 
Well, we, we mentioned Brazil and uh, South Africa both having original powers in the constitution, but the results are quite different. I mean, one example in Brazil, you, you cannot be amalgamated. So municipalities, the state government or the national government can't come in and say, we're creating a metropolitan government out of these 10 municipalities. Everybody has to vote in favor of it for it to happen. South Africa is quite different where you have the municipal demarcation board that actually sets the boundaries of these metros and, and there's not a lot of choice locally involved in that. So again, having original powers in the constitution can mean different things depending on, on what those powers are. Um, so I have one last question, uh, if you'll indulge me. This is a question from the audience and it's a, a question looking at the future. Uh, what are likely to be the primary sources of conflict between national and subnational governments and municipal local governments in mega cities as metropolitan areas continue to grow in the future? So what can we expect down the road in terms of the types of conflict between the, the national, state and local governments in mega cities? Jonathan, do you want to take a stab at that one? It's, it's our last question. <laughs> yes. That's a very difficult question because there's many answers. <laughs> there's many answers to the question. Um, um, can you give me like two minutes? Maybe uh, Nico or Alejandra can take a crack at that. Sure, question. absolutely. Does, it, does anybody else yeah. want to talk about what? I mean, let's make it a general question since it's our last one about the future. What, what do you see in the future? Um, are these cities going to grow? Are people going to move outside? Uh, where are they going to get so big that the national government is going to be threatened by them? And what what do you think is going to happen? So we won't hold you. To, we won't hold you to it either. <laughs> Nico, yeah, sure. It, go, Nico, go ahead. Yeah, um, it's not going to be the conflict. Oh, let, let's put it differently. The big conflict will arise amongst the people living in the, in the metros those that feel excluded, those, uh, the, the poor and the marginalized, who are not saying that the city is, is working for them. And the question then would be is, uh, how are the other, or how are government, the state, because what happens in a metro area uh, are the, usually the focus of power, the focus of government. Uh, it reflects on them. It's not that they can walk away. And starting to address the, the fragility that may be inherent in, in large cities, and particularly, again, in, in the South, in the global South. And they would then have to think through how you, in fact, deal effectively with the marginalization who is responsible both for, say, the built environment, the social environment, and particularly it's the division between your state and your and, and local government. Uh, there's always uncertainty about that. What is the state to do? And what are local governments to do? And trying to see whether there is not a perfect uh, separation of powers, but at least the dominance of the built environment lying with, um, with, with, with local government, um, also within the context of, of the mega cities, and then the more social services, the education um, and health and welfare at, at a provincial or state level, and obviously an overseeing uh, role of, of the national government to ensure that they are funding, where there's failure, state failure, that they can step in. But it's, uh, if you look across the world, the division of powers between state and local government are so diverse. Um, you know, in the US, you say, well, just, you have different ones of whether it's a, 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 a school district, which is a, a type of local government, um, you know, uh, so in other places, education is in fact a, a state measure. So it's very difficult, but there needs to be in each country, according to their circumstances, a way in which you deal with the pressures of, mass, of living in a massive area. Um, and yeah, obviously, 
starting with the beginning is how do you ensure a some coordinated way in which uh, you can service both the people there, make it livable, uh, feel included. And the second one is how it's not the state providing jobs, but how can you create to make the, that, that area uh, productive, i.e. providing uh, the infrastructure that will in fact in the end grow the economy and absorb uh, uh, labor. Okay. Um, Alejandro, do you want to say something about the future? Sure. Uh, so one of the, and, and again, I, I'm not entirely sure that it's the, 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 the one aspect that it's going to bring the most tension, but, but I don't do think that it rel uh, relates a lot to the, the issue of inequality um, and, and segregation. Uh, which I think it's, it's very apparent in, in a lot of uh, metropolitan regions across the globe. Um, and so one of the, of the places in which I've seen actually a lot of tension between state and local governments, um, in, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the US case and then the Mexican case. So in the US case, for instance, uh, I've, I've, I've lived in two places that have sort of like the opposite dynamic where, um, here in California, we have a state government that's relatively progressive. And so it's generally trying to implement uh, certain sort of quote unquote progressive measures uh, related to housing, for instance. And so, and then local governments push back very frequently. And so they, they very frequently enter into, into court battles. Um, whereas the opposite happens in, in a place like Texas, for instance, where a fairly more progressive city like Austin uh, might want to implement things like inclusionary zoning. Uh, and then the state, which has like really strong property rights, will, will not allow it because it will consider it a taking. So that those are some of the tensions that, are, that I've seen uh, rising more and more. Uh, and, and, and we have more and more sort of like court cases uh, with those battles. Um, Another of the things that, that comes to mind, it's also sort of a, um, are we thinking of what sort of the role of the state or governments uh, should be in different arenas, right? Uh, and, and what levels of government should uh, sort of uh, address different issues, right? Because uh, on the one hand, as I mentioned before, we, we do have, um, we do have the, the, the sort of, um, idea that the centralization is good and it's important and that local governments are very important because they are the ones closest to the people. Uh, but there's there's certain um, topics that obviously transcend the local sort of uh, jurisdictions and, or political boundaries and that need to be addressed at, at higher levels. Um, and whether also I think there's, there's a really big contentious, uh, contention of course, here in the U.S., but increasingly in the global South as well, as to how how much it is the government that should be sort of um, um, I'm 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 blanking on the word, but but sort of having more more jurisdiction on certain areas, or should it be the market that takes care of? Uh, of course, service provision is one thing, but, but for instance, something like housing, uh, promoting it to be uh, more accessible to, to, to uh, populations that, that, of course, cannot, cannot access uh, market rate housing, for instance, but also other, other goods and services. So, so those are the, are the couple of things that come to mind. And, and I would close um, by, by just... Uh, Talking a little bit about the Mexican case, I think I'm a little bit optimistic in the sense that I think there's growing recognition that the, the centralization efforts that started to happen in the 80s and 90s, uh, like we have to admit that they were not necessarily successful in the sense that we didn't, we never really uh, gave uh, municipalities the, the, the financial and administrative capacities that they needed. To, to really uh, sort of respond to all of the, of, of the responsibilities that we were giving them. Um, and and so, so I think that that recognition is, is, is um, somewhat common in, in policy uh, circles, as well as um, I think the need uh, for 
like I, I do think that we've we've talked about the importance of metropolitan governance for a lot of dec like for several decades, and it's finally, unfortunately, a little bit with the exception of the Mexico City case, because I think it is sort of like extreme case of of, of fragmentation, um, and and encompassing three states and and an ever increasing number of of municipalities, but. But um, medium tier cities, I, I do think, are moving towards uh, a more collaborative um, approach, uh, especially around environmental matters, I would say. Thank you. Is it, is it my turn now? Yes, yes, I, I, I called your name, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think I think mega cities will continue to grow. I think given the um, increasing population growth across the world, especially in Asia, Africa, um, and in South America, uh, mega cities I think is going to be a constant feature of governance in many of many countries across the world. And the tensions I think will never go away, uh, primarily because it's governance and there are always tensions in governance. We, um, there, it's, it's, a, it's, it's part of the polit political realm. You know, there's, there's, there's always tensions because there are different clashing interests uh, between levels of government. And there are, uh, as in the case of the United States, uh, different political parties that have different uh, ways of uh, doing things and a different perspectives about, about how things uh, uh, should be done. Uh, I think the tensions will also arise in shared responsibilities between local governments and higher level governments because there's, there is a tendency to point to the other side as the one that, the, the, as the one that's not doing its job as opposed to exclusive mandates were in. It's, it, it is clearly the responsibility of this level of government to provide the service. So, um, in, in, our, in our experience, in the case of um, local governments, they would um, rather that the higher level government undertake the more expensive projects when in fact these are shared responsibilities between them. So the local governments would rather um, have projects that are good politically for their voters um, as opposed to um, projects undertaken by the national government. So mostly infrastructure projects would be the province of a local level government because of the ambiguity in terms of who is responsible for what. Great, thank you very much. And, and those themes certainly resonate in Canada. I think COVID-19 has really shown the cracks in the federal fiscal structure. Municipalities have been on the front lines delivering services uh, without enough resources to do it. And the federal government has had to come in because they have more resources and greater ability to borrow uh, to, to fill those gaps. And it is then a question of who does what and how do we pay for it? And I think a number of you said we have to think about that. The other thing we've seen is that, that uh, certainly in Canada, cities don't really have a voice at the intergovernmental table. We have federal provincial discussions, but rarely are local governments included in those discussions. And I think um, we have to rethink that as well. Uh, so that, that brings our session to a close. I think we've, it's been an incredible discussion. Uh, I've learned from Nico that there is no such thing as a mega city. Um, and that's true because the sheer size of mega cities makes them difficult to govern, especially when they comprise multiple municipalities. But that means we have a need for agreements among the local governments, formal or informal agreements, particularly everybody talked about land use planning. Uh, there's also the issue about how these very large cities uh, are a threat to state and national governments. And so we would expect some conflict there. So we need, as I said at the beginning, to, to coordinate horizontally among municipalities within these megacity regions and vertically between the local governments in those megacity regions and the national and state governments. 
Uh, we had an interesting discussion of bottom up versus top top down regional governance, and I'm particularly interested in that. I think the top down is is not finding favor around the world anymore. I think we're seeing a lot more of local governments coming together because they think they need to cooperate, and then so it's much more bottom up. But I think these mega cities are too big to fail. And we really need to think about what we're going to do. Um, uh, Nico talked about a mega city being a whale. So if I can end by saying a whale is too big to fail, uh, we really need to, to, to look at these questions of how to deliver services and share costs within the mega region. I'm going to ask you if you please, uh, um, this is the audience now, please complete the post event survey. Uh, by clicking on the link in the YouTube chat box if you're on YouTube or on the Facebook uh, comments section uh, if, if you're in Facebook. I just want to say thank you to the panelists. That was an amazing discussion. Thank you to the audience for those excellent questions. We were planning on ending a little early. We couldn't because the discussion uh, was so great. We just kept going and, and um, taking up most of our time. So thank you again to everybody. And I'm going to turn it back to Rupak for some closing comments. Thank you very much, Enid. Uh, I, I was just thinking about what you said. You know, instead of wrapping up in an hour and a half, we've actually used almost the full two hours. It's a riveting, riveting discussion. And I think very comprehensive, looking at everything from, uh, you know, the politics of mega cities, so as, as Nico has pointed out, don't exist, uh, to issues of coordination, financing, governance, fragmentation. It's just amazing. And, and, and uh, you know, as, as, uh, uh, as uh, Jonathan has, has noted, this is something that's, uh, I mean, uh, these, metro, these large metropolitan areas will continue to grow as we see greater urbanization in, 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 the, emerging, in the emerging world. And so I think this is something that we'd have to think about more and more. And certainly in the context where we live in Canada, uh, we know that the, the large metropolitan regions, while not mega cities definitionally in Canada, uh, as they exist like Toronto, are, are, are larger than some of our provinces and are more diverse, have greater uh, challenges in terms of governance, but have no constitutional recognition. And, and so this is a conversation that I think uh, we, we will have to keep uh, having again and again. Uh, you know, the, the last, the last uh, series uh, or the last event in this series at the beginning of June is looking at the future of federalism. And we, we've brought together a, pan, uh, a, a group of panelists who are practitioners. And one of the things uh, I, 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 I will ask them or I have asked them to address in their comments uh, is to look specifically at the role of local government, I mean, not just mega cities, but local government writ large. Uh, and so I'm, 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 I, this, 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 this discussion very nicely sets the stage uh, for that. Uh, but you know, let me end uh, by, by thanking you, Enid, for your very able uh, moderation and many, many thanks to Nico, Jonathan, Alejandra for taking the time to join us. I know you all have very busy schedules and I'm very grateful that you've taken the time to spend two hours with us addressing what I think, uh, when I, and I'm biased here, this is an issue I'm, I'm personally greatly interested in, uh, but it is, it is the issue of our times and, and made more so salient, you know, as Nico mentioned, uh, because of, of COVID and the frontline uh, role that local governments uh, have played and, 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 and mega cities are sort of the, uh, if you like, the, um, the, lab the laboratory for everything that's good and bad when it comes to government.